one trick. Pony, there isn't any other description that perfectly fits uh, John Kennedy. I'll just let you see her. They had a, a judicial hearing today to decide um, uh, um, some of Biden's uh, judicial uh, nominees. Look at the confrontation between him and Michel Debris. It is just purely for him to get some sound bites. Uh, so he can be, I don't know, they'll share a clip on Twitter, they'll share a clip on Fox News, and it's all so predictable. Senator Senile is he's been dumped, and uh, well, he just smells of BS whenever he opens his mouth. In particular, I practiced civil rights law in the Eastern District and Western District of Virginia for 18 years. And so the quality of the federal bench in Virginia is something that we're really devoted to. Mark did a good job of talking about Jasmine Yoon's career, private practice, judicial clerkship, U.S. Attorney's Office, University of Virginia, now in corporate compliance for one of Virginia's primary employers, Capital One. Um, she really has a wide breadth of legal experience. Uh, we've never had an Asian American member of the Article Three bench in Virginia. Um, and as Mark pointed out, to have come to the United States at age 14 speaking virtually no English, and four years later to get a full scholarship to UVA, when she graduated from undergrad, she received the award as the outstanding undergraduate uh, or, or graduate the year she graduated. And she also received the Jack Kent Cook Foundation Scholarship to go to UVA Law School. Truly an amazing record. Let me just say one more thing. People who have degrees from UVA are quite impressed with themselves. That, that's no comment on Senator Whitehouse. I'm, just, uh, I'm talking about other people. But the only thing that makes that an endearing quality is they're even more impressed with other UVA graduates who do public service. UVA has a tremendous track record of putting people into the Peace Corps, putting people into foreign service and other public service positions. Mark and I, when we were governor, we appointed the boards of the, the board of the University of Virginia. And we know this institution very, very well. In my 30 years in public life, I have never known of a UVA graduate who has the devotion of the UVA alums that Jasmine Yoon does. And that says an awful lot. They're extremely proud of her. She's here with her husband and her daughters and her aunt and her sister and their parents. I know her family is extremely proud of her. She would be a tremendous, tremendous asset to our federal judiciary. And that's why Mark and I are so proud to be here to introduce her today. Thanks to both the senators from Virginia and now Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. It's a terrific uh, honor and joy to join Senator Reid in uh, introducing Judge Melissa DuBose and to welcome to the Judiciary Committee not only Judge DuBose, but her partner, Amy, their sons, Cameron and Wyatt, her sister, Dion, and her niece, Hannah. You often hear me talk about how important honest courtrooms are to our system of government. An honest courtroom protects people's rights maintains order, and holds wrongdoers to account all without fear or favor. There's no better way to ensure Rhode Islanders can walk into an honest courtroom than to confirm a judge like Melissa DuBose, whose professional experience, intellect, integrity, and grit will make her an exemplary federal judge. A native Rhode Islander, Judge DuBose has served on the Rhode Island District Court since 2019 where she oversees a heavy and fast-paced docket of criminal and civil matters. Before that, she spent nearly 10 years in-house as corporate counsel at Schneider Electric, a Fortune 500 company, where she handled complex high-stakes issue of federal law and compliance. She began her legal career as a prosecutor with the Rhode Island Attorney General's Office, where she spent significant time in the courtroom on a daily basis. This is all pretty impressive. But it's even more so when you consider how Judge DuBose got here. She began as a night student at Roger Williams Law School while working full time as a history teacher in the Providence Public Schools. Judge DuBose, your former students will be very proud. I'm not the only one who believes Judge DuBose is eminently qualified for the federal bench. The professionals who know her best agree. That's why she's received an outpouring of support from virtually every element of the Rhode Island legal community, from law enforcement to public defenders, and from every level of the Rhode Island judiciary. 
In a small state like Rhode Island, Mr. Chairman, we know each other. And the legal community is small and particularly well knows each other. And the outpouring of support Senator Reid and I have had for our selection of Judge DuBose to nominate for this position has been uh, really remarkable. The Rhode Island Police Chiefs Association Lord Judge DuBose's exemplary and wide-ranging record of public service and reputation for being forthright and committed to ensuring that all are afforded due process. They note, as Senator Reid mentioned, that she's passionate about wanting Rhode Islanders to have trust in the legal system, a value that all members of law enforcement share. Prosecutors in the Rhode Island Attorney General's office, led by uh, Attorney General Peter Nerona, former United States Attorney, say they are impressed by Melissa DuBose's commitment to seek justice in all cases assigned and her appreciation for the day-to-day and institutional challenges faced by law enforcement. They appreciate her practical approach to problem solving, her easy accessibility, and her innate mindfulness as to the human, real-life consequences of her decisions. The Rhode Island Public Defender's Office also praises Judge DuBose for her wealth of legal experience, strong legal background, and integrity, humility, and grace. The Rhode Island Supreme Court reports that Judge DuBose has the qualities that are critically important to becoming an outstanding member of the federal bench. Experience, education, integrity, judicial temperament, and commitment to public service. We received letters echoing the sentiment from every other level of the state judiciary, and without burdening everybody with my remarks while we're trying to get to the panel, let me just ask unanimous consent that all those letters be put into the record of this hearing. Without objection. At the end of the day, the most important expressions of confidence in Judge DuBose came from the colleagues who she will join if confirmed. A letter to this committee signed by all members of our United States District Court states, Melissa's integrity is beyond reproach, her professional competence is varied and deep, and her judicial temperament is exemplary. Everyone on our court is pleased at the possibility of welcoming Judge DuBose to the federal court if she is fortunate enough to be confirmed by the Senate. As I said, we know each other in Rhode Island, and when the judges of our district court offer that thought, it is significant. They conclude thus, Melissa is a daughter of Providence. She grew up here, worked here, studied here, brought up her family here, lawyered here, and now judges here. Melissa is an outstanding choice to join the federal branch, supremely qualified. Her ethics are impeccable. Her temperament is judicious. And I'll just add in closing, it is uh, no wonder, given this warm welcome, uh, that upon his decision to assume senior status, a decision which created this vacancy, the federal judge whose seat Judge DuBose has been nominated to fill actually encouraged her to apply. I really can't think of a better endorsement than that, and I'm delighted, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, Ms. DuBose is our recommended nominee and was recommended by uh, President Biden, and we look forward to seeing her through to a safe confirmation. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. It's now my honor to enter. All right, now, first, Senator Kennedy, and I'll ask questions in a minute. So the reason I'm late, I apologize, is that we're trying to find a way to move forward uh, as a conference and really as a country on securing a border and helping Ukraine. To my Democratic colleagues, uh, the bipartisan bill has many good things in it. It's inadequate to the task. I have some ideas to make it better. Uh, I would like to pursue those ideas, see if we can have uh, more discussion about securing our border. I told people back home, uh, Senator Durbin, that I want to help Ukraine. If you lose in Ukraine, you'll put the world in a great peril. If you don't fix your border, you're putting America in great peril. I intend to try to do both. I don't believe we have made a genuine, full-throated effort yet to secure our border. A couple ideas. Uh, The Trump-Obama years, 5,600 parolees, individual assessments, uh, two years of the Biden administration, over 800,000. I want to put a cap on parole. I think the bill doesn't do that. I don't trust the Biden administration to stop paroling people in, so let's put a cap on it. You may not like that idea. When when is it an emergency? 5,000 is not an emergency per day. It's a catastrophe. That's what the Border Patrol Union said. I'd like to take it down to 1,000. At that point, we have the authority to uh, to shut the border down. I've got a few ideas that I think would be substantially better than 
what's been proposed. So I want to pursue those ideas. Then we'll turn to our friends in Ukraine, and I will be uh, uh, very glad to help them because we need to help them, Israel and Taiwan. So that's why I'm late. I don't know how this movie ends. Uh, and to all of you, congratulations on your nomination. And I'll yield to Senator Kennedy if he's next. Congratulations, Stalin. <clears throat> Judge DuBose, am I saying your name right? That's correct, Senator. Okay. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to be direct. Uh, I think most of my questions are designed to be yes or no. Um, are you still a Marxist? Um, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, you don't have to thank me. We'll say um, you, I'm, I, I am, you are welcome. Um, I am not, uh, nor have ever been, a Marxist. Well, you gave an interview in 2000 to the feminist press. In fact, you didn't turn it over to us. We had to ask for it. We found it on our own. And you did then turned it over to us. Um, and this is what you, you were describing your time working in a coffee shop. You said, quote, the kids would come into the cafe all the time. We'd talk about what they're doing. We'd talk about their classes. And I was in my Marxist phase. So you used to be a Marxist, but you're not now? Uh, no, Senator, if I may. The context of the first of that interview, um, I had no idea that that interview was something that was going to be published. I did an interview with but, the... But did you mean what you said, whether it was no, published or not, or whether no, we'd find it? No, no, trying to understand what, what you believe. You no, said sir. I was in my Marxist phase. Thank Are you, you, Senator. you still in your Marxist phase, or was that in the past? No, Senator, if I may explain. Sure. Um, I was a political science major. When I graduated from college, I immersed myself in a ton of political theory. I read Hobbes. I read Locke. I read Rousseau. I read Marx. I went through a phase where I was into Eastern religion, where I read the Tao Te Ching, uh, the Analects of Confucius. So I suspect, and I don't know that that quote with the article, um, I don't know if she was referring to what I was studying at the time, but as a political science major and as a theorist and someone who was considering teaching a course in political theory, I had I immersed well, myself but, in those but things. But she didn't refer to anything. She meaning, I assume you're referring to the, to the reporter who interviewed. These are your words. And you didn't say, I'm in my Hobbes phase. You didn't say, second... I'm in my lock phase. I mean, you didn't say I'm in my Russo phase. You said um, I, I'm, I was in my Marxist phase. And my sim question is real simple. Are you still a Marxist? Uh, Senator, I've never been a Marxist, and I'm not a Marxist today. Okay. All right. Have you ever served as lead counsel in a federal bench trial? Uh, no, Senator. With my experience as both a state prosecutor, as an in-house counsel at Schneider Electric, doing very complex compliance and regulatory work, and my work as a district court sitting judge handling general jurisdiction. Yes, I've, I've read your resume. I, I just want to get through these questions. Have you ever served as lead counsel in a federal jury trial? No, Senator. I have not. Okay. Have you ever attended a federal jury trial? And no, Senator. It live? No, no. No, Senator. Have you ever watched a federal jury trial on TV? Um, I don't believe that federal trials are televised, so no, I have not, Senator. Have you ever watched any trial on television? Uh, Senator, I handle and preside over trials every single day as a state district court judge. We follow the rules of evidence, criminal procedure, civil procedure. Um, so I feel that with my experience that I am well-suited and capable to make the transition from our state district court to our U.S. District Court. Okay. Uh, when you were practicing law, did you ever draft a motion or a brief uh, applying the federal rules of evidence? No, Senator. As a state prosecutor... I'm sorry, I, you said what? I said, I said no, Senator. No, okay. Um, when you were practicing law, did you ever draft a motion or a brief applying the federal rules of civil procedure? Well, I believe that there were times at Schneider Electric giving advice to business units regarding uh, the federal acquisition regu regulations that I would draft briefs to give them counsel as to how to be compliant with the federal rules. 
So in that respect, the answer would be yes. Okay. What's an interpleader action? Interpleader action is a third party who's going to intervene in a, in a civil suit. They're not a primary party. Okay. Um, what's voir dire? Voir dire is the process with which uh, jurors are questioned by uh, by the state and Demo um, by defense and prosecutors to serve. And Have a panel. you ever conducted a voir dire in federal court? Uh, not in federal court. Okay. I'm going to yield back six seconds, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Uh, just to clarify the record, Judge Tubos, do you recall when that interview was done, the interview that uh, Senator Kenny referred to? No, Senator, I don't. And, and I, if I recall, and I was brought to my attention yesterday, that was never an, an interview that I did that was I thought was going to be published. I never reviewed it. I didn't. It was an undergrad student who was interested in teaching who spent 20 minutes. what were minutes. you doing at the time? I was teaching. So this was before you even went to law school. This was... Yeah, I, I was many, really many, early. many, many, many years ago. It, it was, Senator. Perhaps during the time when my colleague, Senator Kennedy, was a Democrat. Showing that people can change their views, even if it were true that you were then in a Marxist phase. Senator Graham. Mr. Chairman, my name was invoked. <laughs> I noticed. As a proud Democrat, we were like my that part of My name was history. invoked, Mr. Chairman. Now, I, I just want to let the record reflect, and I love Senator Whitehouse. Uh oh. But I'll tell you one thing I've never been a Marxist. I've never been a Marxist. And I've never admitted I was a Marxist and then not turn the document over to, to this committee. We had to find it. And we did. And now your testimony, the testimony under oath today is, I didn't say that. The reporter said that. No, the witness said that. And then the testimony is, well, I didn't mean it to become public. That's not the issue. So, you know, if we won't get personal here, we can. Senator Graham. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's agree on the following. A Louisiana Democrat is probably not a Marxist. <laughs> but uh, the bottom line is, uh, why wasn't it available to the committee, Mr. Bell? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. I had no idea that the um, article existed. When I did the interview with that undergrad student, mm -hmm. it was for a paper for a class. It's something you didn't know about. I, I was in interview with a young lady who was interested in teaching as an undergrad, and I was just sharing my tradition, right. so, how I went to be uh, so into teaching. I understand. Your testimony is, this is not something I've seen before. Had you seen it before? No, Senator. Okay, so... If you hadn't seen it, you didn't know about it, so that's why you didn't turn it over. That's correct. Okay, just make make sure of that. Uh, Mr. Ali, is that right? <laughs> yes, Senator. You were ahead of the MacArthur or Associated MacArthur Justice Center, is that correct? That's right, Senator. I've been with the organization, yes. Okay, and what role did you play there? Uh, well, initially, about seven years ago, I started with the organization to open its D.C. office just as an attorney there, as the mm -hmm. first attorney there. Uh, and then uh, I was later promoted to be the director of the D.C. office. And then beginning at the very end of 2021, beginning of 2022, I've become uh, the, the executive director of the organization. Are you pretty familiar with the work of the organization, I would assume, right? Yeah, Senator, we're a... The, pretty large, medium-sized firm that is litigation-focused. Right. And so we have, at any given time, you know, hundreds of cases. But yes, I, I'm familiar with the general work of the organization, of course. So I'm, I'm reading an article here that talked about a spokesperson uh, <clears throat> described after the George Floyd um, um, episode, a uh, terrible thing that happened for the country. Uh, you said, or some spokesperson said, uh, you want to lead a movement toward making police departments obsolete, that the group lobbied the New Orleans City Council to pass a resolution committing to sharp reductions in law enforcement in the city's 2020 budget and redirection of those funds to housing, health care, education, among other priorities. Is that accurate? Uh, Senator, uh, 
uh, a colleague of mine actually sent me that article in mm -hmm. advance of this hearing. Yeah. Colleague was surprised by it. Needless to say, yeah. I was surprised and quite disconcerted by it. Okay. I could tell you, uh, Senator, that uh, I looked into those events. All of those first took place before I was ever executive director of were, the organization. Were you a member of the organization then? I was in the D.C. office. None of those uh, events described took place related to the D.C. Well, office. So do you disavow those statements? Well, Senator, uh, yes, absolutely. I, the organization, let me be very clear about this. Uh, I have never advocated for taking away police funding. Uh, I would not take that position. The MacArthur Justice Center has not taken that position. I think that's why this colleague sent it to me, surprised. That's why I was disconcerted and actually looked into this. Uh, I can say very clearly, I had no role. So that's not you. I mean, you, you disavow the comments that were made in this article by some spokesperson before you got there, before you became executive director. Senator, I do not believe law enforcement okay. is or should be obsolete. Okay, or defunded. Or defunded. Okay. Uh, the organization apparently also called for dismissing all charges against rioters from the protest in Chicago. Um, a Black Lives Matter uprising. Do you, are you familiar that the organization called for that? Senator, again, I didn't have any personal involvement in that. That was before my time as being executive director. Uh, when my, did you become executive director? Uh, it was at the very, it was in December of 2021. Okay. So <clears throat> the, I think the riots occurred in 2021. Uh, are you familiar with the position of the organization asking the mayor of Chicago to drop all charges against Sen the rioters? Senator, only because I read it in that article that you're referring to. But it's news to you until then. That's until right. This article. I, that's right. And as I said, I looked into it. Well, because let's put it this way. If you're a part of the organization and it's news to you that the organization wanted, what would we say if some Body came up and said, I want everybody in January 6th to be let go. I don't. I want them to be prosecuted because I think they broke the law. So I guess my point is there comes a point that this organization has done some pretty radical things. You never heard about the position of telling the mayor of Chicago to let them all go? Senator, let me be very clear that I understand fundamentally that the position I've been nominated for is to leave That's all not advocacy question. That's behind. Not my question. My question is, did you know? And if you did know, how could you not know? Well, Senator, at the time, I was an attorney in the D.C. office. I had no oversight I, I, over that. I don't that. need to belabor the point. My time's over. And, 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 and I, here's the point. You're becoming executive director. Somebody saw you as promotable. Okay? They want to promote you. This organization is taking some pretty extreme views. You say you don't know anything about it except you read this article. It's hard for me to imagine promoting somebody, an organization that calls for all the writers to be let go in Chicago, and the person they're promoting doesn't share those views. Senator, what I can say is that I've worked closely with law enforcement on these issues, and as I discussed before, it's actually been a bridge-building, coalition-building process you. working My with organizations Thank you very across much, the sir. spectrum. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Blumenthal. Uh, Ms. Yoon, thank you very much, and thank you to all the nominees for being here today, and congratulations to you and your family. Uh, Ms. Yoon, um, I'm interested in your view of the ethics challenges facing corporate America today, and whether you think that federal authorities are doing enough to set guardrails and safeguards against conflicts of interest, violations of federal law by the corporate leaders and corporations themselves in this country. Thank you, Senator. Um, as the Vice President of Corporate Integrity, um, I am overseeing the ethics program at Capital One. It's been a privilege um, of my professional career to be able to do so, and I have learned uh, quite a bit about ethics and compliance in corporate settings. I think that it's important um, that our corporations and officers uh, behave honestly and ethically, and every corporation um, has responsibility to have 
a good a code of ethics as well as awareness campaign to make sure that uh, associates follow the code of ethics and stay um, ethical and honest. Uh, as to what policymakers should do, um, that is not something <laughs> I think as a judicial nominee I could um, comment on, but um, as somebody serving in the ethics and compliance area, I do believe that it's paramount um, that corporations pay attention to the ethical culture um, as well as the bottom line. And you'd be sensitive to those concerns, and I would hope all the nominees would be as well. Mr. Ali, you have uh, a truly inspiring American story. In fact, so do really all the nominees this morning. Different stories, but all of them deeply impressive and inspiring American stories. I'd like to ask you, because you've received some questions about past activities, the MacArthur Foundation, would any of the positions or statements made by the foundation or you as a member of that foundation staff have any impact on your service as a United States District Court judge? Absolutely not, Senator. Um, let me ask uh, also, has your experience working in that foundation informed your personality about the meaning of justice in America? Perhaps one of the reasons why your parents and Ms. Yoon's and, and others uh, before them, because we all have an immigrant story, so does each of you, maybe going back a little bit farther. I do, going back just one generation, my father, a German immigrant. But that uh, seeking justice here, as your work in the MacArthur Foundation informed your feelings about that value. Senator, I've been very privileged in my career to represent large corporations uh, in private practice and to represent some of the most needy uh, folks in, in the United States. And I've had the incredible privilege of arguing before the United States Supreme Court. And I actually walked past the court this morning. And every time I do go there to argue, I look up on my way in and see those four words, equal justice under law. Um, that has greatly informed uh, my thinking. That said, I understand and appreciate, because of the profound respect I have for our Constitution, the very different role uh, that I would be called upon to have if confirmed as a federal district court judge. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, congratulations to all the nominees. Thank you for being here. Uh, Mr. Ali, if I could just come back to you. Uh, I want to follow up on what Senator Graham was asking because I didn't hear all of your answers. I just want to make sure that I've, I understand where you are on these issues. So just, just to set the table here, you're the president and executive director of the MacArthur Justice Center. Is that correct? Senator, that's correct. I have one other disclosure for you, which okay. is that I'm also a, a 49ers fan. Oh, and no. So I'm... Oh. Just Starting apologizing in advance for what Christian McCaffrey and oh, uh, no. and Debo Samuel will Fresh unleash talk. on your oh, Chiefs my gosh. this Sunday. Oh my gosh! Here we go. All right, all right. Um, I'll come back to that. Um, so let me just let's just clarify some things you said to to Senator Graham. So your organization, the MacArthur Justice Center, has expressed support in the past for the defund the police movement. I'm looking here at public statements, public. Uh, comments that the organization has made um, calling for defunding the police, hashtag defund the police. Here's one. Here's the second one. I, I know you're familiar with these. And I thought I thought I heard you say to Senator Graham that you disagree with this, that you do not support defund the police. I just want to make sure I got that right. Senator, that's right. I have never taken that position, nor would I for any number of reasons. One of which I'd like to say is that I work closely with law enforcement on these issues of accountability, public safety, and confidence in law enforcement. Okay, good. So to the extent that, that the center has in the past taken this position, that does not reflect your views and doesn't reflect your leadership. Is that fair to say? That's right. So much though that I looked into that and tried to figure out how that hashtag, I understand there was an article describing two tweets that had been made, uh, looked into that and uh, I'm still to this day puzzled how that happened, but they were before my time as executive director. Well, you say puzzled, puzzled why the center expressed those views. Is that what you're saying? To my knowledge, the center itself has never taken the position of defund the police. Okay, and and you disagree with that position. You disagree yeah. with the defund the police position. Okay, let me let me ask you about something else. I think Senator Graham was touching on. 
um, my understanding is is that the, the MacArthur Center asked the Chicago State Attorney's Office to dismiss all the charges against rioters following the BLM riots in the summer of 2020. Is, do I have that right? And if so, do you agree with that? Senator, my understanding of that circumstance uh, is that the attorneys in that office, I wasn't a part of that office at the time, represented individuals who were peaceful protesters uh, and represented community groups. And so that letter took place in the course of advocacy that, that I wasn't personally involved in, so I'm not intimately familiar with the fact. Okay. You, you would not support, though, dismissing charges against rioters who committed acts of vandalism, violence, et cetera, as a general matter. Senator, I believe that people who are a risk to public safety uh, need to be accountable and need to be held pending those charges if they're a risk to public safety. And I understand the law to require that. Let me let me ask you, since you, you said pending, um, uh, my understanding is that MacArthur Center also opposes pretrial detention. Is that right? Uh, Senator, the so let me be very clear. I believe that if somebody is a risk to public safety, they should be held. And, and federal law requires that. The Bail, Bail Reform Act requires that in addition to some other considerations. And if confirmed to be a federal district court judge, I would apply that law without reservation. So why I got you. So just the, the center, though, am I wrong? They don't oppose, your center does not oppose pretrial detention. Am I wrong about that? Senator, there's no categorical opposition to pretrial detention, as I understand it. The United States Supreme Court has been very clear uh, that someone cannot be detained solely on account of their poverty. Uh, but to my knowledge, the Justice Center's position has been that if someone is found to be a risk to public safety, then, uh, then detention is warranted under the law. And what about the use of electronic monitoring of defendants? D does the MacArthur Center oppose that? Senator, again, my understanding of federal law is that the supervised release Provision. Well, but I'm asking about the center, though. I, I'm, I'm familiar with federal law, but the center that you're the executive director of, just, I just want to clarify. I, I want to make sure I understand what, what your positions are. Yeah, I appreciate that, Senator. So I haven't personally worked on a case involving electronic monitoring. I can tell you that the center is not a policy organization. We don't have a single employee in our organization who takes policies. All of our work is grounded in litigation, in a client. Okay, let me ask you, I, I'm, I don't mean to interrupt you. I mean, I do mean to interrupt you, but I don't mean to be rude about it. I'm almost out of time, but let me just ask you this. The director, as I understand it, of your Illinois office referred to electronic monitoring as replacing one form of incarceration with another. Does that reflect your views or the views of your organization? How about, does it reflect your views? Let's just get to that. Um, Senator, I'm not sure I fully understand what that would mean under federal law. I can tell you that the bail, the, the, the bail Reform Act, the Sentencing Reform Act, and the supervised release provision require supervision in certain circumstances, first and foremost, when there is a risk to public safety and a need to protect the public. Well, I'll just, my time's expired, and I know that there are other, other colleagues here who want to ask you questions. My, I appreciate your answers. This is helpful. My concern has been that the center that you're the executive director of seems to take positions to me that seem frankly a little extreme. So maybe those aren't your positions. I'll give you some more questions for the record. I was so nice to you, even though you're a 49ers fan. It's horrible. But the Chiefs, I know I was really nice. Um, the Chiefs are going to win by 10, at least. At least. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll watch together. Uh, without objection, we're going to enter into a rec the record a letter sent in support of Mr. Ali's nomination by current and former prosecutors in the Department of Justice. <laughs>